Today's reading is from John 1, verse 1 and John 1, 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here ends this morning's readings. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing that has been made was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of mankind. If we go a little bit fur further forward, we see he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, and to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision or husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made its dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace. I found, when I first encountered these things, I found them strange. And some of you may find them strange, and if you find them strange, you're prepared for today's sermon. If you don't find them strange, then take a moment to think back to when you first encountered these words so that you can follow along with us. How could the word exist before creation? How could word become flesh? I have pictures in my head of these kind of word-filled men uh, running around. How could the Jesus that in my case I'd read about and understood before these words, how could he be the word? You may wonder, is this just wordplay? Is this clever plays on words and everything, or is there something to that? And that's what I'd like to take apart today. So here's what I'm going to do. I've, we, we've heard the scripture, and hopefully I've given you a little bit of, of teaser, a mindset of the puzzle that we're in. And I'll spend the first half of this giving kind of a traditional interpretation, and that's probably you know, something solid you can take away. And then I'll spend the next piece giving a personal analogy that may or may not connect with you, but connects this deeper for me. And we'll wrap up from there. So we start with, in the beginning was the word. And the emphasis here, if you hear the beginning, the Jews and those who heard this would have connected that to the creation. The beginning to them means before creation, before the first creative act. This is deliberately connected, deliberately the same wording as you would have in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This denotes a time of existence before beginning. This parallels Genesis 1.1 in more ways than that. In the beginning was the Word, and through him all things were made. If we go back to Genesis, the creation was affected by Word. God said, let there be light. It was God's Word that brought light into the world. God said, let there be an expanse. God said, let there be water. The Word was part of the means of creation. Word, you know, if we look at the word used here, we always have problems that these things are inadequately rendered into our human language 
and in particular whatever language we happen to be in. The word here is logos uh, in the original Greek, um, which connotates many things, right? It signifies spoken word, as we see might be connected to the creation. Um, and it signifies speech, but it also signifies reason and doctrine. Uh, and so we should read this probably as being this is the thought, the spirit, the mind, the concept is the thing that we're talking about here. This is what existed before. Commentators will say that they maybe this means the whole gospel, and I think that's on track, but I would personally think it probably even means more than that, that we are limited in our words and we can't capture it in even what is what we have captured in the gospel, at least the gospel in the words of the Bible, little w words, uh, probably doesn't capture it. Uh, this is the all-encompassing word in concept. The word was with God, and the word was God. In some ways, this is kind of an elaborate, a, lot, a bit of repetition, and yet it reminds us what this is. I would say at this point, this is an expression of the Trinity. And for both you, I can connect to that as something you already have and not try to explain it myself. Uh, it points out that it existed separately from God. It was with God. Um, and yet, it was fully God, capturing the oneness of God that exists. Now, this notion of Christ the Word seemed very funny to me when I first read it, and yet is not, uh, this is not the only place we see this. Later in Paul's letters, we see Christ say, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. There again, that larger concept of the Word, the wisdom of God. So this is something we're familiar with and we encounter elsewhere, even if it seems weird in this particular context. Now the Word became flesh and made a dwelling amongst us. Flesh here, we can certainly take, to take on material, talk about the material nature, that it came and manifest itself in the world. And the distinction here is from the spiritual nature. And we've already established in the first verse that this, the spiritual nature already existed. He already had a spiritual nature it is a spiritual nature that now comes down and manifests itself in in flesh and it made his dwelling amongst us and if you look at the words here uh, the actual words here mean to dwell in a tent now that may seem odd that would seem particularly odd to me at this point in time to dwell in a tent right uh, looking further at it they would say that a more literal translation of this is the word tabernacled amongst us. Not sure if that's moving to enlightenment yet, but it's on the way. Uh, I will remind, you know, I'm reminded that in our previous uh, sermon series, when we looked at the story of God, we looked at the tabernacle and the temple. And the tabernacle particularly was the tent where God lived when they were in the, in the uh, wilderness. It was the temporary structure where God inhabited and came to meet with his people, the Jews, at that point in time. And so what we see here is talking about, the, um, is talking about this meeting place between God and man. And in this way, it makes a bit more sense that we can see now Jesus as the material form, the temporary form of God in which he comes to meet with man. The temporary place where man and God meet. And there's a chance for us to see more than just the little words, but to see the whole word, the concept, the spirit of God. One of the things that Daniel Flesher was, um, often came up in his sermons is he would say, preach the gospel, use words, 
when necessary. Emphasizing that words were not adequate enough in many cases, that actions and totality is much larger. And I think that connects to this passage as well. Right? Here we have that we had the word, but for that word to really be communicated to man, that word uh, was, was more than being expressed with our meager words. And was instead, um, we, well, it became inhabited in the flesh and life of Jesus Christ so that we could better understand the word, the concept of God, the word of God. So I hope that that's, this has helped some to see that, that this is not just some clever wordplay. There's a deeper meaning within this that the word, the spirit of God is the thing that has existed and it has come into the world to meet with us so that we might understand it better. And as strange as it is, yet it carries this deep truth. And hopefully then, as a result, much of the strangeness goes away. And that's where, from the beginning, I'd say some of you may have gotten past that. This isn't strange. It's all perfectly natural now as you think about the word, the word, the wisdom, the concept of God existing, and then coming down and meeting us through Christ. I'm now going to flip to uh, you know, a personal analogy here. Yes, I'll borrow Paul. You know, Paul at times says, I, Paul, speak these things to distinguish. So I, Andre, speak these things. You know, and they haven't been approved by the elders either. Um, so we'll see if I get to come back. Um, uh, I won't claim that this is inspiration. On the other hand, I'm humble enough not to claim that I invented this. Unfortunately, as with all things, I'll leave it to you to decide what's inspired and what's not. So I have to give a little bit of background um, for me and perhaps the audience I think about. I'm a computer scientist by training. I'm an engineer, computer engineer. I write programs. I program computers. I study computer hardware deeply. I design computer hardware and systems. This is what I, this is what I do. This is where I spend most of my thought and deep time. Uh, so what you might see here might be good news for the modern nerd with a deliberate play on good news for the modern man. As Paul was the Pharisee's Pharisee, perhaps I am the nerd's nerd. Okay? So that's the context in which you have it. My tribe does not tend land. We do not herd sheep. And as a result, pastoral analogies don't necessarily resonate with us. I see the beauty of the tabernacle and using that language and the God inhabiting the tabernacle um, after I've thought hard about it, after I've spent a day of study. That doesn't come as natural to me. So perhaps with these verses, there's something that comes more natural. And I guess I may have to excuse myself if I sound to speak in tongues here a little bit. You got the interpretation first, um, and I'll interpret for you later if necessary. But I think maybe, maybe uh, this can be, this will connect at some level. I write computer programs. It's not the only thing I do, but it's one of the things I do. Right? Um, I might say, let p sub 0 equal 2. Let max p equals 1. Let n equals 2. As long as n, and you get the idea. I write these things down. So what are these things? What are these computer programs that I'm writing? They're words. Specifically, they're words that instruct. They're words that instruct my computer how to behave. I compile and run these programs. When I compile and run these programs, my programs, my words, create a world. They dwell in that world. They temporarily become manifest. They 
dwell in the world. Maybe they become flesh in that sense. This is something I understand and think about every day. Uh, my programs and my words may exist before the world they create. So my words are pretemporal to uh, the, their, their existence, the existence of the world. In fact, to some extent, they, in some cases, they bring the world into being. Uh, when I create a world, all things are created by my code and my words. My programs give life to that world, as we've seen that the word gives life to our world. Uh, without these words, there would be nothing. It would be cold, dark circuits that had no meaning. I can take that perhaps a step further. One of the other things I do, more my, more my colleagues than me, but I've done it in toy sense, is I've built robots and programmed robots. And I say, there, you can see one that I built many years ago, uh, there. I write words, programs, that instruct my robots how to behave. And when I load these into my robot, my words become material. They, become, they enter the physical world. They become mechanical, perhaps more uh, literally than flesh. But for a time, they dwell in our world. So that's not a foreign concept to me either. So if we look at it from uh, this standpoint, these things that were particularly confusing, this notion of a pre-temporal uh, existence, uh, these notions of words being instantiated into the words, well, these are not foreign concepts to my, pe my people, right? And perhaps many of you uh, in today's day, uh, world. My vocation, if you will, is a tiny reflection, a small imitation of the pattern that we see in John 1. And that gives, for me, perhaps some deeper meaning to what happens in John 1. Now, this is an analogy, and that's always dangerous, right? Um, so the last thing I want is for somebody to walk out of here, particularly maybe somebody who nodded off for a moment, and say that Andre said that Christ was a robot, OK? I'm not saying Christ is a robot, right? It's not that, OK? <laughs> certainly no more that I'm saying we're robots, right? And certainly no more and probably much less than Christ said that we were sheep or that there were mansions in heaven. Uh, it's an analogy that I find useful and I humbly offer to you in case it may be useful to you or people you know. One of the things we, we know is we were created in God's image. And as we were created in God's image and that means we do many of the things that he does. We have the spirit of inspiration to create. Uh, I do my father's business. I think I do my father's business when I, in turn, create. When I write words and turn them temporarily, at least temporarily, bring them to life and bring them to manifestation. Now, again, I don't want you to walk away with a heresy here. As a creator, I know I am not God. I am not omniscient. You know, uh, I have sinned. And my sins do my creations. My words are never perfect. My creations are never perfect. Uh, when I first put things together, when I create my first attempt, is never good in the sense that God said that it was good. I hope that maybe after my hundredth attempt, things are adequate. So what does and doesn't matter here, right? I, I've just um, espoused a little bit of a personal connection um, uh, talked about some mechanics of it that maybe help me understand what's going on, right? Um, but I think, you know, the mechanism doesn't matter to us. In my field, one of the things that's very important is we think about abstraction. And in abstraction, we separate out what this thing does versus how it does it, 
right? Um, and it's important as we design things that we use these programs that we depend upon the abstraction, the intent, the concept, um, and not the implementation. We should not the thing to get hung up with. And the connection here, and this is something I guess as a scientist to some extent I struggle with, is that my salvation doesn't depend on my understanding or misunderstanding of the mechanism. And in that sense, I hope not to mislead any of you. And whether you follow my analogy or not is unimportant, right? That's the thing that's unimportant. Now one, one more thing perhaps to connect to that. And I will tell um, an, an, uh, perhaps a modern parable. Again, not inspired, but perhaps inspiring. So I could tell the parable of the great piano player. A family of mice lived in a grand piano. They enjoyed listening to music that came from the great piano player who they never saw, but they believed in, because they enjoyed the music that came from the piano. One day, one of the little mice got especially brave. He climbed into the bowels of the piano and he made an astonishing discovery. The music did not come from a great piano player. Rather, the music came from wires that reverberated back and forth. The little mouse returned to his family, greatly excited, and he was able to tell them that they no longer needed to believe in the great piano player because they now knew about the vibrating wires that produced this great music. The mouse in this case confused the mechanism with the concept. We as humans outside this story know that the mouse seeing part of a particular mechanism didn't invalidate the original belief in the great piano player. And so, again, our understanding, my attempt to understand the mechanisms should not undermine the belief and the concept that is behind it. So what does matter, right? What does matter here is that God the Word created our world. God the Word came into this world to dwell with us so that we might better understand that word, that it might be better communicated to us. God offers to upgrade us by sending us his spirit, so send us more words that we might use to live our lives better, and he offers to preserve us beyond the end of this temporary material world. Because our physical bodies are temporary as well. And he offers to bring us to continual dwelling with him. And so it's for us to choose to accept his invitation to this communion. And perhaps it's divine inspiration that our invitation hymn uh, emphasizes the fact that this world is not our final dwelling place.